Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Ben Cleary. Our topic today is the Affordable Care Act and how it affects you both as a taxpayer and as a tax preparer. Recently at the CCA Small Firm Services User Conference held in Atlanta back in October, Carrie Gibson, a CPA and one of our product managers here at CCA Small Firm Services, explained the Affordable Care Act. Let's go to that video now. Okay, quick rundown of the agenda, implementation timeline. Why is this a timely discussion now? A couple reasons. There are some pretty big uh, components that roll out in 2013 that you guys can start planning for now. There are also the tax return you're about to file for tax year 2013. How many of you know that that could potentially impact the tax year 2014 tax return that's filed? A significant impact. Okay, good reason to be here today listening to that. We'll go over the legislation map. ACA is a huge piece of legislation. It creates a ton of touch points that have never existed before between private industry and between government agencies. So executing that is going to be huge. So we'll give you a little idea of what that looks like. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the individual impacts. Okay, ACA results in the largest set of tax law changes in over 20 years. I think the biggest one part of that was TRA 86. Anyone here live through that? Yeah. But ACA includes over 50 different tax provisions. Uh, we are not going to be able to cover all 50. We'll cover the ones that have the broadest and most immediate impacts to you guys. So um, in addition to the 50 tax provisions, it has over 400 billion in revenue raisers. Where do you think a lot of those are coming from? New taxes to your clients. So uh, ACA is actually made up of two different pieces of legislation, both passed in March of 2010. And then we kind of sat around on pins and needles while some components rolled out. Will it, won't it, what's going to happen until June of this year in which the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the whole entire piece of legislation. So with that, here we go. We're going to start rolling on it. So we will take a quick look at the timeline, retroactive through 2015. And we're going to look retroactive simply because some of those components are still rolling out and still have some applicability to you guys that may or may not have had the opportunity to execute on them. So 2010, uh, we had the rollout of Form 8941, the Small Employer Tax Credit. That was probably the biggest one that we hit, um, and we'll cover that one quite a bit more. 2011, we had some changes to the elective health contribution. So the FSA, HSA, MSA, some change in definition, as well as some changes in the tax there. 2012, this is the one where this is pretty much the only place that we will talk about it because it is informational only. But for tax year 2012, employers are required to report the value of the health premium or the health benefits on the W-2. If you guys remember, that was delayed from 2011. However, there was further relief put in place for small employers. So for any employer that filed less than 250 W-2s in the prior year, they do not have to report the health benefits on the W-2. So for most of you guys, this will be your customers. They're not, they do not have to put health care benefits on there. 2013, we have some additional taxes that are going to roll out, and mostly at the higher income earners. So if you have any high income earners, something to pay attention to is what's coming up in 2013 at various medical components of the tax return. We also are going to have the state exchanges that are going to start to be up and operational. Are you guys familiar with the terms, the state of the exchanges at all? Okay, we will cover that quite a bit. So you'll hear me reference them, but we'll hit upon them a little more. But basically the exchanges are where individuals who do not have coverage are going to go to obtain coverage. 2014, the heart and soul of ACA kicks in in the form of the uh, mandate required to have health care. So along with that, of course, goes the subsidies with it. And you will have the, um, some employer requirements kick in, large and small business requirements. In 2015, there's nothing major that rolls out here. There are some components, but I have 2015 up here because for you guys, this is where all of the impacts of 2014 will be reported on the tax return, and it's going to impact your uh, filing season 2015 and beyond in the form of new reporting requirements as well as new notices and correspondences that you can start to see from the IRS. Um, legislation map. So ACA, 50 pieces of legisla or tax legislation, but that's the tax component only. It is huge. It is broad reaching across many different government and private agencies. So 
So we're going to see the uh, new and existing entities are going to be key to the process. They're going to interact in unprecedented touch points before. There will be more data and validation and exchanges going on behind the scenes that have ever happened before. Those systems are in the process of being built right now and sorted out between all of the key players. Um, there's going to be new reporting requirements both between government agencies and from private industry into the government agencies for all the reconciliation and the back end work that has to go to make sure the mandate, the penalties, all the different components are being executed on and accounted for correctly. So I'm going to give you guys a quick overview of who these agencies are because you may be interacting with some agencies going forward that you have never had to interact with before. We've had to interact with the IRS, that's a common. We've had to do some interaction with SSA through uh, IRS. But um, there is going to be more data coming from the tax returns that you file being fed into all of these agencies. So HHS, Health and Human Services, makes sense that they are the hub of ACA, of implementation. They own the overall process. Most of the components will ultimately flow in and out of HS, HS, HHS. IRS has probably the second biggest role. They are responsible for all of the income tax reporting requirements, and that comes down to creating final regs, creating tools, creating new forms, um, validating and feeding pieces of demographic and financial data to all of the entities that will use this to make decisions on what taxpayers are and are not eligible for. Um, FMS, anybody or familiar with the FMS? How many times have you had a refund come back with reason for it was uh, lower than anticipated for FMS. This will be another reason that we're at. Shannon, I think, was talking about in one of her sessions yesterday, reasons for a refund to be reduced. FMS will be the administration of the subsidy payments and penalties as well, so that could be a new reason you start to see uh, coming back. SSA, anyone get a 500 series reject ever? <laughs> another reason for one, the, S, uh, it, the SSM validation will still have to happen at the end of the state exchange. So. Uh, don't expect those to go away anytime soon. And then DHS, Legal Resident Verification, and SEC, they have to do the administration of the oversight of insurance providers. And you guys care about this because insurance providers now have reporting requirements to taxpayers or to the holders of the policy, which often translates into a taxpayer. State exchanges. State exchanges are going to be the uh, face, the interaction point between the taxpayer um, and all of the other government agencies and the insurance providers. So they're going to be who the taxpayer or the individual goes to in order to determine their coverage eligibility, different plans that they're eligible for, as well as subsidies. So um, the state exchanges will interact with the taxpayer and on the back end do all of the other interaction they need to do with these other agencies. And we'll talk in just a little bit about what some of those validation points are. And then there's the federally operated state, operated state exchanges. Those are for people that are in states that do not have a state exchange. Okay, our external, all private industries, employers, they have the minimum coverage requirement that some are going to be uh, subject to. They need to be aware of those issues. Employee notices related around the health care benefits that they provide. They're going to have reporting requirements on if they provide insurance and whether they don't provide insurance that they're going to have to do, as well as their own income tax reporting requirements. So one thing to think about this, um, from the employer point of view, this is not just for your, uh, for your clients and their businesses, but for your businesses as well. So as we go through this, think about the impact to you guys and how you need to execute on it as well. Insurance providers, they have new reporting requirements, uh, government reporting requirements, as well as reporting requirements to individuals. So that has never happened before in the form of a new 1099. And individuals, they're the ones that are required to have health care coverage, as well as ongoing reporting requirements to the exchanges. And we'll talk about that because this is a key point for many taxpayers to be aware of that they are not currently aware of, and they're going to have their income tax reporting requirements. Okay, let's start running through the impacts, and we will start um, with the individuals, and we're going to try to work through these in a sequential order so you can see what's upcoming and uh, you know what rolls out a little bit later. And the first two we're going to talk about take go into effect on January of 2013. Um, and you guys actually care about this right now because there are several planning opportunities that are involved in what's about to roll out January 1st, 2013. Because by the time these go into effect, you may or may not have talked to some of your clients at this impact. So 
Um, think about what, as we go through this, if there's an opportunity that you need to start reaching out to some of your clients right now to let them know what's coming and any adjustments they need to make. So the first two are some of the revenue raisers we talked about for um, individuals, and they are for high income earners, and they are in the form of two new Medicare taxes. So on January 1st, um, high income earners with the thresholds we have up here, so 250 MFJ, 125 MFS, and 200 for all others, they're gonna be subject to additional 0.9% tax imposed on any wages earned above and beyond that amount. And I actually just misspoke, not on wages, on income above and beyond that amount. So that's just an automatic 0.9% right there if they exceed those income thresholds. Now one thing to be aware of, and here's where your opportunities come in, this additional tax is on the combined income. So if you have a taxpayer that has multiple jobs or a married filing joint return, it is on the combined wages of both jobs or of the taxpayer and spouse. The employer is only required to withhold on wages they pay in excess of this. So that means need to look for opportunities. If you have taxpayers that exceed this amount and it comes from multiple sources, do they, but before January 2013, do they need to um, do additional withholding on the Form W-4, or do they need to look at filing some estimated taxes so they're not hit with it, um, a bill at, on their 2013 return? Any questions on that one? Pretty straightforward? Okay. This one's a little more complicated, and this is a 3.8% tax on unearned income. So this 3.8% is in addition to capital gains rates and with those Bush era uh, capital gain reduced rates going to effect, this is gonna be on top of that. So this could be a pretty significant impact to your clients that have unearned income. So we're looking at the same income thresholds for which they define a high income earner, but how they calculate this 3.8% is on uh, the lesser of the net income or net investment income or the modified adjusted gross income in excess of the threshold. So, now, at this point, net investment income is, the, is your traditional uh, definition there. You have interest dividends, your passive uh, activities, um, reduced by income, but one to be aware of here is the home sales. So, any sale of home in which the capital gain exceeds the excludable amount is subject to the 3.8%. So the IRS anticipates coming out with a schedule to calculate this. This is not uh, going to be a straightforward and easy calculation. They are currently uh, finalizing the definition of what exactly net investment income is for purposes of this additional Medicare tax. Um, and one thing I do wanna mention is that a lot of this still, it's a very new law. The Supreme Court just made its final decision. There's still a lot of squishiness around this, still a lot of regs being defined. So keeping up with this, watching for it, setting up Google alerts for any of these items that you think your clients are gonna be subject to is a really good idea. So you can see the latest and greatest as the IRS asks for comment for input as they finalize the definition and the rules. So, um, and while we don't talk about it here, or I don't have it up here, estates and trusts are also subject to the additional 3.8%. So um, planning opportunity we put up here is withholding uh, to determine if um, you need to file, or withholding's not required. So do you need to file estimated taxes if you're gonna have a client in this situation? Another planning opportunity, I was actually talking to one of the attendees a few days ago, um, Eric, he's around, I'm sure he's around here somewhere, but um, whether or not, if you have clients that are planning to divest of passive activities, should they do it now instead of 2013? So right, there's a narrow window for, which that, for that to happen. But if they're planning on divesting of some of these, you probably wanna take a look at whether or not they need to do that sooner rather than later. Okay, this one's a little retroactive and forward-looking, 2011 to 2013. And 2011, there were some changes made to your electable uh, medical with uh, plans, your FSA, HSA, MSAs. The definition of a qualified medication change. So you can no longer do over-the-counter medications as of 2011. So if you're like me, the end of the year, I didn't worry so much about what was on my FSA, because um, I would run out to Walmart, raid the pharmacy, and stock up on everything that there was to uh, use up the remainder of my FSA. But that is no longer allowed unless those over-the-counter medications are prescribed by a doctor. Um, we also have the uh, tax 
uh, non-qualified distributions going up for HSAs and MSAs to 20%. So had, did anybody have any clients impacted by that already? Okay, so something to be aware of there on that end. And on 2013, the allowable contribution for FSAs goes down from 5,000 to 2,500. So, of course, it is indexed annually after 2013, but it will go down. Medical expense deduction, itemized deductions on Schedule A, as of January 2013, the threshold increases from 7.5% to 10%. So, here's your exception on this one. Taxpayers age 65 or older are exempt from the increase until after December 31st, 2016. In the case of a married filing joint return, it is based on the age of the oldest taxpayer as of the close of the tax year. Um, two things to note, the AMT threshold remains at 10% and the definition of qualifying expenses does not change for the purpose of a Schedule A. Okay. okay. So 2014, the heart and soul of ACA. This is when the minimum coverage requirement kicks in. But January 1st, 2014, individuals are required to maintain minimum coverage for themselves and their dependents. So um, as always, there is an exemption for those mandates. So exempt individuals uh, include your, uh, those already covered by a government-sponsored plan, your incarcerated individuals, those with religious conscience, religious objections, there's a whole laundry list of them out there. Um, but the exemption will be granted by the state exchange. Someone doesn't get to necessarily say, okay, I fall under one of these exemptions, but they have to go to the state exchange and be qu uh, granted an exemption. So, it's, um, what a ACA does not include a public option. Most public, po most public uh, healthcare policies in other countries include a public option. We do not, that's a big differentiator for us. So individuals who are not currently covered are required to get private insurance. So private insurance, where can that come from? Uh, you can have your employer provided coverage. People that already have existing medical plans on their own that like them, they're grandfathered in, they can keep them. Or from uh, your ex existing of government-sponsored, Medicare, Medicaid, any other state programs they may be a part of, and then the federal and state exchanges. So anybody not covered under any of these will go to the state exchange to get coverage. So along with a mandate, has to be enforceable, right? So with the mandate comes the flip side of penalty. So in, if, they, if taxpayers do not obtain minimum coverage, they will be subject to a penalty that is assessed per person or per dependent. Of course, we have our exempt individuals who are not subject to the, to the uh, mandate. We also have, and I keep moving around because there's several definitions that are different across, so I wanna take a look at, um, as I explain some of these, I will give you a definition of what they are, um, but also in the materials we hand out so you don't have to write it all down, but you have those unable to afford coverage. And the definition of not being able to afford coverage is that in order to participate in the lowest tier exchange or in the government plan, it requires more than 8% of their income. And household income does not, is below the income tax filing thresholds. Now, did anybody hear um, soon to be Acting Commissioner Steve Miller? He testified before Congress a few months ago saying at this time the IRS does not anticipate being heavy handed in enforcement but we really don't know what enforcement on the mandate or the penalty is going to look like right now. To give you guys a quick peek for the idea of what the penalty is, uh, there it's calculated on the greater of either a flat dollar amount or a percentage of the taxpayer's uh, household income. Household income is a new definition that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But you can see it's tiered in over three years in which it's fully in at uh, 2016, and it's indexed for inflation after that. Now, of course, there, uh, this is not going to be a straightforward calculation. There are several rules in place to keep it from being uh, an excessive penalty. So, for example, uh, it cannot exceed the national average for the lowest tier, the penalty cannot exceed for the lowest tier health care, cannot exceed 3% of the household income or the flat penalty uh, cannot exceed the 8% of the taxpayer's uh, household income. So. 
The premium assistance credit, have you guys heard of this one either? Okay, so if they're gonna require people to have health care coverage, for those in the lower income, they also need to offer them the uh, opportunity to pay for it or help pay for it. So this is a subsidy portion. So the premium assistance credit is a refundable tax credit or a cost sharing to qualified individuals who obtain coverage from the state exchange. So that is an important key if they have employer provided coverage, if they get it through an existing plan or from an existing government program, they do not get the premium assistance credit. The state exchange will determine who qualifies for the premium assistance credit and how much they qualify for it. So, and it's in place exactly uh, to keep people from having to spend more than a certain percentage of their income on health care. So that was one of the uh, concerns with uh, health care is the cost to people. So qualified individuals are going to be those that cannot afford minimum coverage based on the ratio of their income to the federal poverty level. Those who do not have minimum employer provided coverage and those who have co do not have coverage through a federal program. So the amount is determined on a sliding scale of uh, based on family size and household income. Household income is a new definition only for the premium assistance credit and it pertains only to the premium assistance credit. So you're not going to see in any other definition for any other forms that comes out. But household income is the AGI of all family members. And a family size is determined by all people that the taxpayer claims a uh, exemption for on the tax return. So you have to take the filed tax return of all those people, figure out what their AGI is, put it all together, come up with your pack, and then they're going to compare it to the federal poverty level. And if you fall between 100% and 400% of the poverty level, then you will qualify for the premium assistance credit. Okay, so the two options we talked about for receiving the PAC, to Joanne's point, one of them is an after the fact payment, and that's where you just calculate on the tax return. So the taxpayer goes into the state exchange, they get uh, their, they pick out their health insurance plan, they have their premiums, they opt to go ahead and pay all of those premiums themselves out of pocket. So then what they will do is they uh, will file their tax return, in which the tax return will calculate the amount of uh, premium assistance credit based on the actual events, the actual data, and then it will be reported on the 1040 up against tax liability up to a refundable credit. So anything above and beyond the tax liability. And then they also have the advance payment, you know, a little bit like the advance EIC used to see, except for instead of the payment going to the taxpayer, the state exchange will pay it directly to the insurance provider on behalf of the taxpayer. So they will pay the premiums keep the taxpayer from having to pay that out of pocket up to the amount of the premium assistance credit. So this is where, so if their amount of premium is let's say $100 a month, they qualify for the premium assistance credit up to $80 a month. So there's a $20 differential. The taxpayer is going to be responsible for that $20. So if they elect for, to do the after the fact payment, they're going to pay that $100 directly to the insurance provider and then they will do a true up on the tax return for the premium assistance credit in which they anticipate that they qualified for $80 based on the information at that point in time. That amount may or may not change depending on the actual circumstances determined on a month by month basis at the end of the year. However, if they do the advance payment, and let's go back to the $100 premium, and they qualify for $80 of assistance, there's a $20 differential there. $80 will be paid by the state exchange directly to the insurance provider. That $20, the taxpayer is going to be responsible for getting to the insurance agency. At least that's anticipated how we'll go at this point in time. Um, you know, as all the systems are worked out, they may come up with something like the taxpayer sends them out to the state exchange and they pay the whole amount. But those are the types of things that still have to be determined. Does that help at all? Okay, so both of these. <laughs> will require a true up or a reconciliation on the tax return. So there will obviously be a new form around this. So, caution, eligibility for the PAC, for the premium assistance credit, at the time the state exchange is determining it, may be based on tax return data that is one to two years old. So, right, we all know how sometimes our taxpayers' lives move at the speed of light like the rest of ours. They have a change of life scenario that could ultimately impact the amount of premium assistance credit they're eligible for 
at the, at the end versus what was the estimate at the beginning. Um, okay, so let's run through a quick scenario for um, where I said that it could be based on tax return data that's one to two years old. So state exchanges will open for enrollment starting in October of 2013. They are required to have health insurance start on, as of January 1st, 2014. There's going to be a little bit of time there, but that's when the mandate kicks in. Okay, so if they go into a state exchange because they don't have coverage, let's say November of 2013, and the state exchange goes out and starts pulling all the information that they need to determine the uh, plans they're eligible for, to determine their amount of premium assistance credit, they're going to get the latest process tax return, which is going to be 2012, right? So that's what they're going to go out and get, and that's the data that's going to come back to the state exchange. So they go through, they get all of their plan determined, they get their uh, PAC assistance determined, starting for 2014. How many of your taxpayers have something changed between the time they file their 2012 return and their 2014, right? So they are going to be responsible for reporting what are called change of life scenarios up here to the uh, exchange because these change of life scenarios have an impact on their eligibility to get insurance through the state exchange and the amount of subsidy they're eligible for. So let's say um, they got a new job and all of a sudden they work for an employer that meets the minimum coverage requirements. So they need to go to that employer to start getting health care. Or the flip side, they, lo they lose their job, and all of a sudden they don't have coverage. Then they need to go to the uh, state exchange to get insurance coverage. Let's say that they, have, they get married. They have a child. They get divorced. Um, you know, they have a significant change in income. All of those things that could impact their eligibility for a plan and the dollar amount, they have to report those in an ongoing dialogue with the state exchange. Because remember, eligibility is determined on a monthly basis, not on an annual basis. You are going to have to do an awful lot of work. So to become a trusted advisor to your clients for what's going to happen to them in 2014, you have to start talking to them in 2012, right? Because a lot of these people come to you for their biggest financial transaction of the year once a year, right? So. Um, you're going to have to start talking to them about it now. You're going to have to figure out what the charge is for it. You know, once uh, the forms are added for the, um, for the tax return, of course you can apply your form charge if that's how you bill. I, you know, whether you do value billing, time billing, um, or perform billing. That's something you're going to have to think about your time investment on that. So This type of information is not going to come from a do-it-yourself, right? You have to know this. You have to know you need to talk to them. You, have, um, you know, you need to understand their family size, their makeup, their employer situation, events you know that are coming down the road. So this is where, like Kim was saying, you can start to tell the stories with your clients about what you do, the value that you provide, because if they're not hearing it from you, they're likely not hearing it from everyone. Of course, there are education campaigns that go on from the IRS, you know, from various, you know, the insurance agencies, all the different education that's going to go on. But how often do things change that are major and they come in and they never even knew about it, right? And you're, they're hearing it from you for the first time, even though it's been out there, out and about, you know, for, for a year, maybe more. So let, let me flip through and see. We talked about the change of life scenarios. Very, very important. Um, okay, 2015. Let's talk about what this means really quickly because this will be a big deal for you guys. So 2015 is where all of the reporting requirements come in for everything that happened in 2012. So you're going to have new income tax reporting requirements. You're going to have your new premium assistance credit form. You're going to have your individual mandate tax form. And you're going to have taxpayers with new forms 1099 as well as any documentation that may be coming from the state exchanges talking about the coverage and the assistance that they receive. So you're going to have all these new pieces of information that have to play into the tax return term and eligibility, you're going to have taxpayers getting forms 1099 that have never gotten one in their entire lives, right? So they're going to get them later because they're due later than forms W-2. So all of a sudden you're potentially in a situation of delayed or amended filing for tax returns uh, for people that file early in the year or has, have historically filed early in the year. 
because a lot of, this is going to hit your low-income taxpayers, those that like to come in early and get the process done and over with. Um, you're going to have new correspondence notices. So all these touch points we're talking about with data going back and forth, IRS, HHS, the state exchanges, all of this information is being compiled and, into a, and validated on the back end, so one database. So the IRS is going to be able to do matching on the amount of premium assistance credits. So, you know, what's being reported there, does that match up to what the state exchange said that they actually gave the taxpayer throughout the year? Um, those types of things. So um, you're going to see also the mandate tax, depending on what enforcement looks like for that. If they think people are subject to the mandate tax, are you going to get correspondence notices on those? Um, so all of that kind of comes together for the perfect storm for a uh, fun, 2015 filing season from the individual perspective alone because we are out of time so we didn't even get time to talk about the business part components which are in here because there's large and small business requirements around uh, providing minimum coverage around some credits let me mention to you guys really really quickly a great source I printed these out so when you see them um, if you have IntelliConnect um, you know going out there there's a wealth of information um, through out there about the Health Care Act, but even for those of you that don't, CCH puts out these wonderful tax briefings. So it's everything in a synopsis, a quick readable snapshot of all the different components. You can just go out and Google the CCH tax briefings and pull it up, but I would really suggest you do this and go through and just understand all the components that relate to you and your clients um, in a very digestible format. Well, there you have it, the Affordable Care Act. My thanks to Carrie Gibson for her explanation of the Affordable Care Act, and we thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.